Okay, uh, this is Edmund Stark at uh, the Michigan State University St. Andrews STEM Center. And we are about to embark on a, another one of our Zoom talks, Planetary Motion and the Planets in May, June, and July. So um, we are, as I mentioned, we're at the, which is not Michigan State University main campus, but we're at the STEM Center right in Midland. We got hit with a flood, so um, we were delayed for a bit. Um, the same flood that hit a bunch of others. So I'm, the two of us are the only one in the building right now, and I'm going to just go ahead and get on with the show. So the agenda for tonight is similar to what it usually is. Talk a little bit about uh, what I wanted you to go out and see in the sky from last month. What's out in night? tonight and this month, planets in the evening and morning skies, some seasonal things. The focus tonight will be on planetary motion as per the title. And the modern astronomy highlight will be the recent SpaceX launch. I was thinking of doing something more related to planetary motion, but it was kind of hard to pass by the SpaceX launch. So part one, homework from April. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Venus was that beautiful evening star in the West. It's the best show for many years to come. And uh, it will be gone pretty much by the end of May. As I said here, this is a slide for May. And Mercury was coming up and they were in conjunction on May 21st. Um, and I have a slide about that. So I hope you were able to see that. Um, Saturn, Jupiter and Mars were in the morning and we, we had our last chance of watching Betelgeuse. Now, as Venus was high in the sky up here, it was heading down into the sun. Mercury was down here and was coming back up, which means they have to meet. And that was on May 21st, um, where the two were less than a degree apart. Boy, I hope you saw it. The skies were clear on the 20th, 21st, and 22nd, I saw those two close together about three times. It was really cool to see how fast they move when Venus is moving rapidly and Mercury always moves rapidly. Um, Mercury is always bright, but it's close to the sun. But on June 3rd, Venus passed between the Earth and the sun. That's called inferior conjunction. It's a conjunction because it's at the same um, place as the sun, inferior because it's between us and the sun. And Venus has now entered the morning sky. Now, I mentioned we had those three clear days around the conjunction. That is very unusual. These data here, I present them every talk. They show that uh, if you're looking for a day that's less than 30% clouds, you have a one out of six chance of getting that. So if you're interested in seeing stuff in the sky, if check the sky. If it's clear, go out. You may not, and check it out. You may not have another opportunity for another week. So this month, all five planets will be visible this month. Now, the five I'm talking about are the ones that have been known since ancient times, Venus and Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They were known to the Greeks, they were known to the Romans, to the Babylonians, and other cultures as well. Since the telescope was only invented 400 years ago, that means they're all visible to the naked eye. They look like bright stars, but they move against the background stars. Now, Mercury is in the evening after sunset, Venus is rising in the morning sky. Jupiter and Saturn are at night. Mars comes in in the early morning hours. And there's a meteor shower I want to talk about. And I want to talk about some um, summer constellations and star patterns. So that's what we're going to be doing. Focus is usually on Venus. But this time, it's a little different because Venus is close to the sun. It's hard to see. First thing I'm going to talk about is a little asterism. I call it an asterism because it's not a constellation. It's called the Summer Triangle. There are three first magnitude stars. And rising, if you look to the east in early June, you will see Deneb, Vega, and Altair. First magnitude means it's among the 20 or so brightest stars in the sky. You can't miss this. If you look to the east and see three objects, that's what it is. Rising in the east after sunset, it'll be the sun in the summer all sky, all, all summer long in the sky. Now, there's one constellation here I'm going to point out to you. You see this big cross. This is often called the Northern Cross. 
for obvious reasons. It's in the north and it's across. But if you look at this as the head and neck of a long swan, this being the tail and here being two wings, you end up with Cygnus the swan, which is that constellation. And that's always something fun to look at. Now here, Mercury is a little harder to see. In mid-June, meaning now, Mercury is the only planet in the evening sky. It's low in the sky after sunset. You'll need a clear horizon. You won't see it over buildings. It was higher before, um, back in early June, and it was brighter even in late May, mid-May, and so it's getting harder to see. I wouldn't worry about it. If you, don't, if you can catch it, great. If you don't catch it, it'll be in the morning sky, and it'll be really nice mid-July to early August. And that'll be a great time to look in the morning sky, and I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. Let's talk about mornings in mid-June. I mentioned Venus is just starting to come out of the sun's glare. Here it is way down here at the bottom. Um, in a few days, the moon will pass by it. On June 18th, the moon will be above it. June 19th, the moon will be below it. It'll help you find Venus. But again, Venus is the brightest thing in the sky, except for the moon and the sun. If you see one star in that part of the sky, it'll be Venus. Now, it reaches peak brilliance a month from now, and it's furthest from the sun a month from that, in mid-August. So you'll have plenty of time to see Venus. I can't not mention this. I have here on this slide, you see the moon here, and the next day you see the moon here, and Venus is right in between. The moon is going to go right over Venus, this time quite literally. It will cover the moon and move past it. The moon will be moving to the left as we're looking at it, and Venus will pop out behind it again um, an hour or so later. The only problem is it's not visible here in North America, but I wanted to mention that these things do happen, and when the moon occults a planet, you will be sure to hear about it from me. So when it covers up a planet or a star, that's called an occultation. That's just a fancy word. Speaking of things that you can't see, June 21st, the day after the solstice, which is June 20th, I'm sure you're all over that, there is an annular eclipse, but it is centered on Mount Everest. It is not visible in the Western Hemisphere, but instead of being completely eclipsed, it will look like this for those enough lucky enough to see it or who wish to travel there. But let's talk about here, nights in June. Jupiter and Saturn are rising after the evening twilight. So at around midnight, they'll be already well up, but it's easier to see them before dawn and they're easy to find. Two bright stars, they're the brightest things anywhere in this area of the sky. You look to the south before dawn and you'll see two objects close together. It'll be Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is the brighter one on the right. Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, if you look at a bigger swath, you can see Jupiter and Saturn here between Sagittarius and Capricorn, if you know your constellations. Mars is way over here beyond Aquarius, but they're still kind of in a line, and there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about that in our planetary motion segment. Mars, just like the other planets, is brighter than any star nearby. You should have no trouble finding it but you have to get up in the morning. And just so we're clear here, two hours before sunrise, you know, in the winter, that means you're getting up at around five o'clock or six o'clock. Now it means you'd be getting up at around three o'clock. So it's kind of a middle of the night thing. But July, 2020, very special time for planets. I've already told you Jupiter and Saturn are visible pretty much the whole night. Mars rises at around midnight in July. Venus is best during the pre-dawn skies in July. So when Mercury enters the sky in July and shows up at peak brightness later in the month, you can see all five planets on the same morning at the same time. This is not something normal. I haven't done any statistics to figure out when the last time this happened was, but it'll be around for several weeks. Mercury will, Mercury will be the tough one and it will be at its best and brightest the last two weeks in July, the first week in August. It's not the best viewing opportunity for Mercury, but when you add in five total planets, and plus the moon will be in the sky as well, um, you've got something really special. So I wouldn't want you to miss that. So 
here's the summer sky that you'll see a couple, in other words, once it gets dark, a couple hours after sunset, which this time of the year is getting towards 11 o'clock. You look to the south and you will see the spring constellations here of Leo and Virgo disappearing and the, the summer constellations Libra, Scorpius and Sagittarius coming into view. And you see Jupiter and Saturn here off to the left of Sagittarius, like I've already told you about. Um, I want to spend some time on these constellations because most constellations don't look like anything. Um, they have a constellation, one's supposed to be a queen, one's supposed to be a king. They look nothing like that. Anyone can see who's ever seen a scorpion, you can see the two arms and the long hooked tail, complete with a little pincer here, that star is called Shaula. It looks like a scorpion. It'll be low in the sky, but it's worth looking. Sagittarius, the archer, the main part of Sagittarius looks exactly like a teapot. In fact, it's even called here a teapot. It's a little asterism. And that's to the south. At around the same time rising in the east, I've already mentioned the summer triangle, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And here, with its wings completely extended, a few stars that weren't in the previous diagram is Cygnus the Swan. Head, long neck, tail, and the entire body, not the wings, but the entire body is inside the summer triangle, making it very easy to identify and recognize. So see if you can find the summer triangle in Cygnus the Swan. So a couple other things. Um, we have an internship for student fellows here in the summer, and that makes for a very busy time. I normally don't give an astronomy night during um, July. Um, so that means that in order, if something happens in August, I have to tell you about it now. August 12th, the Perseid meteor shower. Um, here's the, this is Perseus, one of the great Greek heroes. You can tell what I say that stars, constellations tend not to look like anything. This is one that doesn't look like anything, but that's Perseus. These are called the Perseids because the meteors tend to shoot out from a spot right here near the constellation of Perseus. The peak is in August 11th through 13th. You can expect about 50 per hour. So that means a little bit less than one a minute. When people think about meteor showers, they're thinking, thinking choo, 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 choo. that's a meteor storm. That's a once in a lifetime event. Meteor shower, if you go out normal background condition, you can see five or 10 meteors just at random. These, these 50 will be in addition to those five or 10 random meteors, and they're fairly fast, so they'll be quick streaks. The only thing that interferes with meteor showers other than clouds is the moon. If the full moon is in the sky, brightens everything up, makes them hard to see. The moon is on last quarter on August 11th, and it gets better and better, so this is a pretty good time to see the Perseids. There are two more showers which are weaker they both peak in july the delta aquarids and the alpha capricornids um, between the two of them they'll get you about uh, 25 meteors per hour they're in similar parts of the sky and the moon is bright but it sets early on the 29th which is when they both peak on july 29th and they'll be active for a little bit after that here are the radiant points of the alpha capricornids this star is alpha capricornis here are the, the um, Delta Aquarids, because that is Delta Aquarius. So basically, look to the south in the early morning hours. Meteors are always better in the early morning, meaning three, four hour, two, three, four hours before dawn. So um, if you want to use the Q&A feature, um, here's a reasonable point that if you have any questions, you can um, send that towards me and I'll stop for a moment. Um, we are, we've got half of our lines blanked out um, and it's only 15 minutes, but the rest of our presentation is a little longer. So I'll wait a little bit in case there are any questions. Yep. Uh, we do have a couple. Uh, okay. This one is, what year did scientists find Venus? What year did scientists find Venus? Well, um, since Venus was known since before Christ, it was known by the Greeks several hundred years and studied by them. It was known by the Mayans. It was known by the Babylonians. So Venus has been watched for about 3,000 years or more. 
Um, I can say scientists first saw Venus in, oh, let's say about 1400 or so, because before then there weren't any scientists, but people have been watching Venus for a long time. So Venus is not one of those that's been discovered. It's simply been studied more and more closely as science gets better and better. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, we do. Sorry, I, Mike was muted. Uh, when do you see Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn? You'll see Jupiter, Mars. Mars comes out, uh, rises maybe three hours before dawn. So if you want to see Jupiter and Saturn, you can see them anytime during the night, starting at around midnight on. But uh, it'll, if you want to see Mars as well, uh, three in the morning is a good time. Um, and uh, Mars will be more easily visible later in the year. And it'll be bigger and brighter, bigger meaning it's closer and brighter later in the year as well in October. But you won't be able to see Venus and Mercury and Jupiter and Saturn at the same time. So July is special because you can see all five planets. Okay, and uh, for the meteor shatter, shower, for the meteor shower, would you suggest setting up a telescope? Okay, so question was, do we need a telescope for the meteor shower? Emphatically, no. A telescope looks at a little portion of the sky and it magnifies it really big. Meteors shoot across huge sections of the sky. If you set up a telescope, you'll miss the entire shower. What you do for a meteor shower is you lie on your back on the grass, or if you have like one of those fold back chairs that is almost like a, like a cot, and you just simply look up towards the area in the sky and you'll see them all over the place. Even binoculars are not useful for a meteor shower unless you're part of a scientific study where there's 20 of you out there and you're looking at a little part of the sky. If, you're just, if you want to see the meteor shower, it's a naked eye event. No equipment. That's a great question. OK, and uh, the last one for now that we have is, is it possible to have a copy of these slides? Um, I think the slides are posted. Um, they haven't been in the past because they were all given in person, but I believe the last set was posted. And so I will find out if that's going to happen again. I presume it will. Oh, we got another one uh, no question. from our preschool son. Why do stars look round in the sky? I think stars look round in the sky because they're kind of small. And when something's small, it just looks like a dot. And in your mind, a dot is round. That's my guess. Um, if it's a preschooler, here is, uh, I'm kind of stepping out of my comfort zone here, but if it's a preschooler who's saying stars are round, if a preschooler is actually seeing a round sky, he may need glasses because he may be seeing an out of focus blur. So that's something to think about. All right, so tonight's focus, planetary motion. And I'm gonna give you a little, um, synopsis of what we're going to talk about. This is all going to be looking at the bottom line, literally the bottom line. What do these motions look like from Earth? I'm going to talk about daily motion of the stars and everything else. Um, simple movements like the sun and the moon and planetary motion, which is more complicated. I'll introduce various models that astronomers throughout the ages have come up with to address these. I'm going to introduce some terms that you might not know, or you might. And of course, I'll have to talk about Copernicus and Kepler's laws. But I want this to be focused on what things look like and why. So no math, even for Kepler's laws. So what does the sun do in the sky? All right. It moves, of course, but how and where and when? Daily motion, we know how that works. Sun rises in the east, goes high in the south, and sets in the west, day after day. But every day is slightly different. Right now, it's getting close to the um, solstice, which is June 20th this year. And we notice the sun rises in the northeast, goes really high, and sets in the southeast. So, sorry, sets in the southwest. Um, the northwest, I'm sorry, I'm getting all mixed up. But here in December, it'll be in the southeast, setting in the southwest. Now that's because of the tilt of the earth. I'm not gonna go there, that's a different topic. 
But that's how the sun moves kind of all over the sky. But how does it move relative to the stars? That's a different question. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, basic observations on a daily basis tell us that the Earth is, I mean, we're standing on solid ground. It doesn't feel to be moving. For most of history, people thought the Earth was fixed. Sun rises and sets each day. The moon does it the same, and the stars. The stars rise, go high, and set, just like everything else. The explanation was that there's a sphere or a dome called the sky containing all these heavenly bodies, and it ro rotates around the Earth. It takes 24 hours for everything to return to the same spot. And as an example of that, here is a scene from March 15th. I chose March 15th because if I chose um, today, the sun takes up too much. There's very little nighttime. But here are some of the constellations, Virgo, Libra, Sagittarius. Here's Jupiter and Mars back in March. Saturn was there. Here's the moon. Notice it's between Ophiuchus and Scorpius right here. And I'm just going to have this go for one day and you will watch the stars moving just like they do. The sun is now rising, that's sunrise. And I'm going to stop it here. When I'm not, actually, I'm not gonna stop, I'm gonna let it go. But you can see the constellations are moving. They're still there. The sun looks like it's, it's in the constellation of Pisces. Now the sun has set and now the stars move. You can watch Virgo rise in the east move across the sky along with all the other stars. Everything seems to rotate as a big solid body, okay? And then eventually will set, might not set before sunrise. And you notice all the planets, Jupiter, Mars, Saturn are still where they were. But look at the moon. The moon went from here by Scorpius and Ophiuchus to over here, Ophiuchus and Sagittarius. The moon moved, a lot and this is normal the there are 360 degrees in a circle the moon takes about a month that's where the word moon month comes from it's one month moon takes about 30 days to come back to its spot so 360 divided by 30 that's 12 degrees the moon moves about 12 degrees a day so this is pretty much one day's motion in the sky continuing the math that comes to about half a degree or about the diameter of a full moon in two hours. So you can watch the moon move over the space of a couple hours. If you have a clear night and the moon is easy to see, look for a star nearby and look at an hour later and you will see that it's moved. That's a cool thing. So what do we see in the sky? The moon moves against the fixed stars, but in the opposite direction. It takes a month to come back. The sun does the same thing in a year. Planets also wander. Mars takes about two years to come back to its spot. Jupiter takes about 12 years. And here in this little slide, I have, this is how much Saturn moved in the year 2019, last year. This is how much Jupiter moved in the year 2019. How do we explain all these different rates of travel? And especially here, we notice the sun, the fixed stars form these constellations. We only see them at night, but they're there the whole time. If they're there the whole time, then when the sun is in the sky, it has the constellations behind them. So they're present in the day as well. And this line is the path that the sun follows throughout the course of the year. And that's called the ecliptic because eclipses only happen when the moon is also on that line. That's a different topic. The ecliptic passes through the zodiac. All these famous constellations, okay? The Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Orion, constellation everyone knows, but the planets and the sun are never in them. They're in the, some of these constellations, which you probably know. Here's Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorns, etc., all the way around till you come back to Taurus again. That's why those constellations are important, not because they're the biggest or the brightest, but because the sun and planets move in them. So I'm going to give you an example where I've got the night sky 
I'm studying the sun in Capricorn. I'm going to do this for about 15 months. And we're going to watch the sun move through the zodiac. I have only the zodiac constellations highlighted to make this easy to see. And you will watch it go through Aquarius, long time under Pisces, Aries real quick, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer is short, Leo is long, Virgo is very long, Libra. You get the idea, Taurus. And we're going to go, that's where we started. And now we're going to end over here when it's in Aries. That's what the sun does year in, year out. It moves along that same line called the ecliptic. So here are the zodiacal constellations and their dates, um, which uh, some of you may know offhand. There are problems with these dates. First of all, these times are all the same. Every constellation gets one month. That doesn't match reality. You remember how short, how long Virgo was and how long Leo was and how short Cancer was and how tiny Aries was? It doesn't really match reality. There shouldn't be very many Aries people. There should be many more Virgo. Um, what's worse, the dates don't match the sun. Right now, June, mid-June, the sun should be in Gemini, but it's actually now in Taurus. It won't enter Gemini until June 21st, at which point it's supposed to be in Cancer. So over the, there's something called the precession of the equinoxes, which I won't go into, but because of that, the entire zodiac is off by a month. And in addition, the sun moves through some constellations that aren't in the zodiac. But so much for astrology, let's move on with a better model to explain these things. How do we do this? Basically, the earth is still, the ancients believed the earth is at the center but the moon goes around the earth in its own sphere. Then the sun goes around the earth. And then the planets, like here's Jupiter, for example, the Jovian sphere. Um, they each move in their own sphere and each sphere is deferent or its radius. Deferent is a fancier term. This distance is different for each sphere and each sphere moves at different rates, okay? So we still have perfect spheres, constant motion. But if we look closely, we'll notice that the sun, the moon and the planets are near the ecliptic, but they're not on it. Saturn and Jupiter right now are both above it. Uh, Mars at the moment happens off scale, but happens to be below it. The moon can be very low, almost five degrees, way down here or way up here. Um, how do we explain that? And the ancients realized, oh, the axes of the spheres must be out of alignment. One goes like this, where one rotates like that. And so they don't always line up, but they still have the spheres. But if you look even closer, things get really bizarre. The planets do not move at a constant rate. Venus and Mars are really crazy, but I'll just give you an example here of Jupiter. For this year, 2020, in January, February, it's moving along perfectly well, but then in May, it stops. Goes backwards in the sky against the stars, stops in September, and then continues on in January and on into the next year. Zigzagging, we're sometimes actually making a loop. How do we explain that? Well, that was explained fairly well by a fellow named Apollonius of Perga. This is two centuries before Christ. He had a still better model. Sun, moon, stars, same deference. Everything's just like the last model, except each planet travels on an epicycle within its deferent, so that you're going around and around here while the circle is going around, and the net result is motion that looks like this, just like what we see, round and around, trying to explain that. But if we look even closer yet, it still fails to predict proper planetary motions. Detailed observations show that the speed of the planets is incorrect. And what's interesting is every planet moves faster than predicted and then slower. And it's reproducible. It happens at certain times. It's not just annual, not the Earth's motion. It happens at the same time in the planet's orbit, but at different places for each planet. And this took hundreds of years to gather this data. It takes Saturn 29 years to go around once. So it takes a lot of observations. How do we explain that mess? The Earth-centered theory still understood a way to do that. And this is by a great astronomer called 
um, Claudius Ptolemaeus, sometimes he's just called Ptolemy. Um, it was an even better model, just the same as what we had before. I've taken out the sun and the moon. I just have Jupiter, it's deferent and it's epicycle. But I've got a new thing, the equant. And what this model did is it moved the entire, oops, had it the wrong way. It moved the entire equant, the center of that circle, off of the Earth, making it off center. And therefore, the motion here seems faster because we're closer to Earth. It just looks faster because it's closer. Pretty good idea. This model was so good that it was used for well over a thousand years into the 1400s. It always predicted at least what constellation the planets would be in. But as science got down to making more and more measurements, people realized that it wasn't very accurate. And they added more and more of these epicycles. Dozens of epicycles were needed to explain the planetary motion and still didn't work well enough for science. So modern astronomy kind of begins with Nicholas Copernicus. He proposed that the sun was the center of the solar system. Ptolemy was a geocentric, geo like geology, geo the center of the earth, the, the earth is the center. He proposed that the sun is the center called heliocentric. All planets move around the sun, except for the moon. The moon moves, it revolves around the earth. Now the zigzag motion is naturally explained. The planets appear to move backwards as Earth catches up to them and passes them on the inside track. But there are problems. This, sound, this explains the zigzagging motion really well, very naturally, but it still needs epicycles. People don't, this is one thing people don't seem to know about the Copernican model. You still needed those epicycles to make it work. It didn't work by itself. And this much was already known even by the Greeks. That name up there is Aristarchus. I'm not talking about him, but he had a earth or a sun-centered theory um, 1600 years before Copernicus. So Copernicus's great theory was not well received. Why not? One, to be honest, it might have made the math a little easier, but it didn't predict any better than the earth-centered theory. The other problem is it seems to go against common sense. Someone's trying to tell us that we are moving at thousands of miles an hour. Those are speeds incomprehensible to the ancient world. Frankly, they're incomprehensible to us. And that the earth is spinning, why don't we all fly off? A lot of common sense objections to this. But where things really came to the current understanding of how things work with these two men, Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, and I'm going to talk about each of them. Tycho Brahe was probably the last major astronomer before the telescope age. Telescope was invented by, or popularized at least by Galileo in 1609. Brahe was probably the greatest of them all in terms of the precision of his measurements and the sheer volume of data that he cranked out. He was incredible. Um, I'll skip this stuff about the supernova, uh, but uh, that's a very important contribution that he made. I'm going to go to the quality of his observations. He actually had his own, he was, he was given the title of the Lord of an Island on the island of Sven. And he, he built a castle, Uraniborg, dedicated to astronomy, very large instruments um, for extreme precision of measurements. His instruments were so precise that even on a castle, he determined that instrument movement and building movement was causing inaccuracies in his measurement. He ended up making Stjerneborg an actual underground university right next to the castle where the instruments were mounted on bedrock. Very steady. And he got unbelievably precise measurements. Now, I don't know if you've ever used a quadrant or a sextant, but it's basically like holding a protractor up and trying to see what angle something is at. It's about the size of your hand if you have a good one. This monstrosity here is one of Tycho Brahe's quadrants. You can see the size of this thing. It's bigger than he is, and it gave him tremendous quality of data. Accuracy within 1 60th of a degree, far beyond what anyone else had been achieving. And 
a year or two before he died, he had Johannes Kepler in his, as in his assistant starting in about 1610. Now Kepler, probably the most famous astronomer of all time. And he knew that neither Ptolemy's system nor Copernicus' system worked well enough to fit the data. The data said the star should be somewhere around here or the, star, the planet should be somewhere around here. And it, it wasn't here, it was there. It just wasn't good enough. He joined Brahe and he used Brahe's measurements for his own models. He had a lot of really cool models, some of them based on the platonic solids. I won't talk about those. I will talk though about his, uh, what was seen at the time, his great contributions. Um, it's called the Rudolphine Tables, named after Holy Roman Emperor. These were tables of planetary predictions year after year into the future of where the planets were in relation to what constellation of the zodiac they would be in. Why did anyone care? To predict the future. Many astronomers believed in astrology at that time. They also needed funding and their funding sources were princes who believed in astrology. And this is very easy to understand. If you believe that the position of the planets affects what happens here on earth, if you can predict the planets ahead of time, you should be able to know what's going to happen ahead of time. Anyone who runs a country would really like to have that. Imagine if someone could have predicted the coronavirus. And just as a kind of a fun thing, I wanted to point this out. This, this is a good way to get your name up in the sky or up in lights. This is the full moon, obviously. And there are very few things that you can see on the full moon without a telescope. You can see the ocean of storms. You can see some of these seas here, serenity, tranquility, um, sea of crises up here. But there are very few craters. One of them right here, boom, look at this blast. Stuff spewing all over the place. This is Tycho. They named this after Tycho Brahe. Boom, right in the middle of the ocean of storms. Copernicus. And a, another huge crater, small compared to Copernicus, called Kepler. These are craters that on full moon you can see with your naked eye. And I challenge you to try to find them. If you see one crater on the moon, it's either Tycho or Copernicus. But here's kind of the climax. Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Planets don't move in circles. Kepler said, they move in ellipses. What's an ellipse? An ellipse is like an oval, which is wider than it is long. And the key is the planet goes in an ellipse, not in a circle, and the sun is a little bit off center. The sec that's his first law. The second law is the planet doesn't move at a constant speed. It moves at a variable speed, which is exactly predictable. The closer it gets to the star or to the sun, the faster it moves. The further it gets from the sun, the slower it moves. On this imaginary planet, this is six months movement. It looks like it's probably about Jupiter. This is six month movement here, okay? It sweeps out equal areas defined in this way at equal times. That's how you can imagine how much data he needed to come up with that. The third law relates the size of the ellipse in its largest axis to the period, the time it goes around the, the sun. Essentially, how long a year is on that planet. The length of a year is cleanly mathematically related to the distance of this, which is called the semi-major axis. These are Kepler's three laws. I promise no math, I'm not gonna go in there any further. What I'm gonna do is tell you how, do you, how can you see these for yourself when you look at the sky? So right here, I've got the Earth, Moon, and the lunar orbit all to the same scale. Here's the Earth, here's the Moon, and here is the Moon's orbit. Is this a circle or is this an ellipse? Can you tell? This red thing I'm moving in is a perfect circle. The lunar orbit is an ellipse, but look how close it is to a real circle. You can't even tell them apart. How do you tell? Here's the Earth just 
a tiny bit off center in what's called one of the foci, one of the focuses of the ellipse. And right there is the moon. That's the scale. Let's look at some other systems, look at some planetary orbits, okay? Venus and Neptune have a very low eccentricity, meaning they're pretty much circles. And the sun is right in the middle. Now I'm going to take the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn with a 5% or 0.05 ellipticity. You can see it basically fits right on here so that you almost have a green line. I've made this equal and you can see that Jupiter is a little, that the sun is a little off center for Jupiter's orbit. Keeping all dimensions normalized to the same and stacking up here, here's Mars. You can see that little thin red line jutting a tiny bit out from true perfect circularity, but you can easily see that Mars is off center, or sorry, that the sun here is off center. And looking at Mercury's orbit, again, Hard to tell that it's not a circle, but you can definitely tell that the sun is off center in Mercury's orbit. So the major difference in these elliptical orbits is not that, the, that it's like a really wide ellipse, it's that the sun is off center. Remember that clever equant where Ptolemy and others moved the circle off the center of the earth? That's what made their models work because they didn't know about ellipses, but they figured this out. How do we see that right here? If the orbit is in, of the moon around the earth is an ellipse, then sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's further. When the moon is closest, this is a so-called supermoon, compared to when it's furthest, this is, I don't know if there's a word for it, micromoon, I don't remember, I should look that up. But this, you can see that there's a significant size difference. It looks obvious here, you'd have to be really a trained moon watcher to see it with your eye, but it's plainly visible once you know to look for it. The Earth's orbit around the sun is also an ellipse. Sometimes we are closer, sometimes further from the sun. So we can see here that when we're closer at perihelion, when we're further at aphelion, slight difference in sun size. So we can see this ellipticalness with our own eyes, especially with the moon. And uh, here's a, this kind of comes as a surprise to people. People think the full moon is really big. The full moon is about half a degree. How big is that? Well, there's 180 degrees in the line, 360 degrees in the circle. Each hash mark here is one degree, and the moon is a little bit larger than half that. You wouldn't think it, but that's actually how small it is. Another one of Kepler's laws, the further from the sun, the longer the year is. On this cute little graph here, here um, is the distance in Earth-Sun units. So the Earth is one unit, one Earth distance away, and it is one year long. This is the time in Earth years. Jupiter is about five times away from the Sun as the Earth, and its year is about 12 years long, meaning it takes Jupiter 12 years to go around. Saturn is nine times as far away, and it is about 30 years to make it around. Going the other way, you look at Mercury, it's a little bit more than a third of the way from the sun as the Earth is, and its year is only a quarter of an Earth year, three months. So this is also part of Kepler's laws. Now, how fast do the planets actually move? This is a combination of Kepler's second and third laws, but the planets that are closest to the sun move, not only do they have a shorter orbit, but their physical speed in that orbit is faster. That's what makes Mercury go around four times in one Earth year. So four years on Mercury is one year on Earth because Mercury is, has a short orbit and it's moving at almost 30 miles a second. Earth here is about, 18 miles a second, all the way down. And that's real, that's, those are incredible speeds, miles per second. So one mile per second is 3,600 miles per hour, um, Mach 3, if you will. And the Earth is moving 18 times faster than that. Um, and you can see it just continues to drop as you get out to the higher planets, to the more distant planets. 
So I want to show you some more simulations. Um, here's a simulation, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Okay. Here is the sun. Here is Saturn. And here is Jupiter. Here is Mars. I want you to keep your eye on these two, Jupiter and Saturn, as we play this video. This is the dance that Jupiter and Saturn are going to do for us. Notice how Jupiter's catching up to Saturn, it gets closer. This happened in April. Now they're getting further apart. You can imagine, how are you gonna predict this? Now they're getting closer again, and there's a conjunction right there. And now Jupiter's going past it, and it's basically lapped Saturn, and Saturn will not catch up. That conjunction occurs pretty much on the winter solstice by chance, um, December 21st. Be aware of that, and I will certainly be talking about that. But um, I want to talk as well about Mars. Watch what Mars does once we get this thing started. It simply takes off, travels in a straight line, past Jupiter, past Saturn, and it's gone. And you can see the moon going by, that's once a month. Every month the moon goes by, zoom, zoom, till the sun comes by and a year has gone by. Okay, so that beautiful dance, I've been watching that in the morning all year long and I've seen them get closer, I've seen them getting further apart. They're getting further apart right now. If you start watching, just go out there when you can see it and you'll be able to see them get closer to stop and then get closer together again. Here's something you don't see very much, a year of the sun. So basically if you went out and took a camera at noon, according to your clock, and just shot it every single time at noon, once a day, this is what you'd see. High in the summer, the sun is high up in the sky at noon. But then, as fall approaches, right now it's going to be low in the sky. And here it is at low in the winter. And then it rises back up again. But the thing I want to, the thing that might come as it's a bit of a surprise is notice that vertical line that I have there. And notice how the sun actually goes back and forth left and right of that line. So right now the sun is actually a little slow. Now it is or slow, now it's fast. It's going ahead of schedule. And now it's going behind schedule. Why would the sun move at a different rate? Because of the elliptical orbit of the earth. When the earth is closer to it, the sun appears to move faster because the earth is moving faster. And that translates as a difference in where the sun is at noon. So we can see this um, just on Earth-based measurements. And ancient astronomers were able to figure this out using really cool methods that I don't have time to talk about. Now I want you to watch what happens with the inner planets, which you haven't talked about. Here's the sun. It's in Pisces right now. This is Venus. And this is Mercury. I've got it highlighted here simply because Mercury can sometimes be fall, small and faint. But watch these two dance in the sky as they go around the sun while the sun goes around the zodiac. This is two years. So look at Mercury zooming around. Oh, there goes Venus. And now Venus is in the morning sky. Mercury's evening. Mercury's morning. Mercury's evening. And now Mercury's morning. And now Venus is passing through. And now Venus is back in the evening sky. You can see Venus doing this about once every year. One, that's why I did this for two years. This happens for Venus, one cycle is 1.6 years, where Mercury, it's three times a year that we have this going around. And you can, with this kind of simulation, you can actually just see how they're moving and you can see how they're moving above and below the ecliptic because their orbits aren't aligned with ours. So I think that's just fun to watch. Now I'm gonna show you some constellation maps. 
because it's kind of, e sometimes it's easier to see things when they're standing still. This line here is the ecliptic, the path that the sun makes in the sky, the uh, orange line. I want to call your attention to the black line. That is the orbit of Mars. It starts out here in January, it's in Libra, okay? And in February, it's in Scorpius. In March, it's in Sagittarius. April, it's in Capricorn. Um, May, it's in Aquarius. June, it enters in Pisces. But then look at what's going on here. July, August slows down. September comes to a halt. October backs up. November comes to a halt, then starts accelerating again. So five months out of the year, five different constellations of the Zodiac, and then it spends seven months in Pisces. Imagine astronomers and astrologers, for that matter, pulling their hair out over this. What does this mean? This is this um, movement of the Earth. At this point here, the Earth is catching up, and right here, it's passing Mars on the inside, and over here, it's gone way past, and now Mars is just moving the way it had normally, and it'll start moving Let's start moving like this again. Here, to give you a sense of scale, which is why I did this huge thing where Mars covers six constellations, five constellations in five months. In one year, it's covering six constellations. Jupiter, in one year, is covering about one constellation. And this makes sense. Its orbit is, it's got a 12 Earth years per Jupiter year. There are 12 constellations. On average, it makes through one constellation a month. This box is the size of the next screen. There we go. And here is Jupiter's motion starting here in January. And I'm gonna give you some new terms. It moves forward to the, um, to the left, it's called prograde motion. And then it comes to a stop, which people call a station. Then it has retrograde motion going backwards for three, four months. And in September, it reaches another station and then continues on in prograde. And this exact same pattern will reappear again next year, year after year after year. And it does this for all the outer planets. Now, starting with Jupiter, with the same uh, map, I've got a smaller thing here. You remember how Jupiter and Saturn were coming together? Here is what Saturn does in the year 2020, that big box up here, this is the next zoom in. And here we go, and you can see Saturn, prograde to May, retrograde to October, and then prograde again for the rest of the month with the same two stations. I'm not gonna do this for every planet, but just to give you a sense of the scale of things, here is what we've got for Pluto. And it looks like this. Now, this is not a useful finder chart because Pluto is so faint, it is smaller than any of the stars on this chart. Uh, in fact, here at St. Andrews, we have a 10 inch Newtonian telescope. We have a six inch refractor. We have a 10 inch schmidt cassegrain telescope. If we pointed those scopes exactly at Pluto, we wouldn't see it because it's so faint. But to give you the scale again, this is half the sky. You see the orbit of Mars with that cute little spot there. This was Jupiter. And this little green area right here is the box for Pluto. So you can see how little Pluto moves in a year. And that's why it takes 250 years for Pluto to make it once around. I want to talk a little bit about the inner planets. Um, this image is centered on the sun. And the Earth's orbit right here is defined as flat. That's why it's all in yellow. This is the yellow one. That's the Earth's orbit. You can see that Mercury is off center. Here's the sun and Mercury's orbit doesn't look much different from a circle, but it's clearly off center. Here's Mars. Mars's orbit also is clearly off center. Look at this gap versus this gap. Now, this drawing is kind of cool. If you don't see these colors clearly, move your screen angle back and forth until you see them very sharply. Each of these here, this um, purple means it's above the Earth orbit. 
So these three are all above the Earth orbit. These three blue ones are all where the planet's orbit lies behind Earth's orbit, or sorry, below Earth's orbit around the sun. And the furthest point here is above the sun and above the sun for Mercury and Venus. But here it's below. This is the furthest point. Um, so the planets are, while they're roughly circles, they are clearly ellipses because many of them are off center and they're not aligned. So that's kind of like the take home message. And these are not to scale. If this were actually the sun and this were the orbit of the earth, the entire orbit of the moon would be thinner than that line. That tells you how far away the sun is compared to how far away the moon is. A little bit I want to talk about the inferior planets. That's Mercury and Venus. Here's Venus. I want to tell you what's been going on the last few months. Here's Earth right there, that blue dot. Here's Venus in that orbit inside of us, the orange dot. Venus has been arcing, was arcing towards us February, March, and April, while the Earth was moving more slowly in that direction. So you can see the angle relative to the sun didn't change for a long time. And if you remember, February, March, April, part of May, this Venus was just sitting out there, not really moving day to day. But then Venus arced across our point of view, passed between us and the sun, same speed, but the motion was much more dramatic because it's near us. And it entered the morning sky here. This happens every 1.6 years. Now this might bring up a question. Why doesn't Venus pass directly between the sun and the earth? I've kind of already answered that orbital inclination. The orbits are off by about three degrees. So they don't orbit in the same plane. This is another view of the same idea where this is Earth's orbit and Venus and Mercury and Mars are both misaligned compared to our orbit. Does Venus ever pass between the sun and the earth? It would be like an eclipse, it'd be blocking the sun. But because Venus is so tiny compared to the sun, what it looks like is a small dot moving across the sun. It only blocks a tiny piece of the sun, unlike the moon, which blocks it all up. And that does happen. It's called the transit of Venus because the dot moves across the disk of the sun. It transits. Those are very rare. There were two of them earlier this century. There won't be another one until the, 21st, until the 22nd century, until 2100 something. So if you're hoping to see one of these, you're probably out of luck. Now, Mercury is also an inferior planet, but I want to show it separately because it was doing the opposite thing that Venus was doing. A month ago, with this is Earth, Mercury was over here on the far side of the sun and Mercury entered into the evening sky in this way, crossing behind the sun. So it's now in the evening sky while the, and the earth is of course still moving. And here it is now arcing towards us and has actually gone past this and will soon, very soon be shooting across and return to the morning sky again. And all this happens about three times a year. Now, you may know that Venus is called the morning star when it's in the morning sky and the evening star when it's in the evening sky. Is it ever called the midnight star? No, because if this is the earth, Venus would have to be here on the opposite side of the sun from the earth if it's going to be in the midnight sky. And Venus of course can never be there because its orbit is here. It must remain close to the sun. This affects the phases of, of Venus so that when Venus is here, where I've circled, you see a full disk. When Venus is here, you see a half moon and it gets larger. When Venus is here, you see a crescent. And for that matter, when Venus is here, which is where it is right now, we also see a crescent. So that's what I've got for the uh, I got four more slides on the SpaceX Falcon launch, but this is a good spot to stop if there are any questions about how the planets move in the sky. Uh, yes, we, uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, okay. Well, this one probably goes a little earlier, but uh, 
to the presentation, but does every star have a name? Does every, the question is, does every star have a name? No. Um, people, even in the ancient days, only named stars that they could see. With the advent of the telescope, we quickly discovered that there are more stars than we can name with numbers and letters. So eventually stars are simply named, in a way they have a name, stars are named by their position, kind of like you would name an island as 35 longitude, 27 latitude. So stars have those names, except you have to get into very fine decimals because there are so many stars. And if, they, if they're given a name, it's because of their position. But they won't all have a name like Deneb or Alburio or Shaula. They will have these number names. Okay, and another one. Uh, do stars have minerals? Do stars have minerals? That's a great question. Um, and I have to check my own sense of definition to answer that. I would say no with a qualified no. Stars have substances like metals and they have other heavy atoms like oxygen and carbon and silicon. Um, but minerals are normally ores like iron oxide or um, silicon dioxide or cadmium sulfide or something like that. And while we do have in stars, we have calcium and we have carbon and we have oxygen, we don't have calcium carbonate, which would be a mineral. We have the elements, because, but because the stars are so hot, it's too hot for the minerals to form. So everything is ionized, everything is gaseous, everything is a plasma to be technical. And so it's individual atoms and ions running amok and no minerals except far in the envelope, so far out from the star that you might say it's in the atmosphere or maybe in the planetary belt and not really part of the star. So I would say stars have metals and non-metals and all kinds of atoms, but they don't have minerals as part of their normal um, existence. Another question? Uh, yeah, we have one last for now. Uh, is the center of mass of the two objects at the center of the ellipse? Uh, I, he's referring to the orbits of the planets. Um, no, the sun is so much heavier than everything else that the center of mass of the solar system is inside the sun. So it's not at the center of the ellipse, it's at the focus where the sun is. Now, if you have two things that are um, roughly similar size, like the Pluto Charon, the Pluto Charon system, or the Earth Moon system, if the moon were far enough away, it's possible that the center of mass would be between the moon and the Earth. And there have been systems like that have been discovered. Um, many binary stars, which orbit around one another, their center of mass is between them. But for our systems, the center of mass is almost always inside the heavy body. So it looks pretty much like everything's revolving around one object that's stuck into place. But I appreciate the, um, the insight of that question, because in reality, the sun and Jupiter and the Earth and Mars are all orbiting around a common center of gravity, which is not the center of the sun, it's a little off to one side. That's all the questions for now. That's all we got? Okay, great. So technology highlight. Um, you, like I say, I wanted to do something about, there's all kinds of stuff happening about planets, but I couldn't ignore the SpaceX launch. Um, the Falcon 9 rocket was launched from Cape Canaveral on May 30th. Two astronauts were sent to the International Space Station, um, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. Why is that important? Because since the year 2011, the space shuttle was decommissioned. And since that time, the space station was, was crews were sent up in a Soyuz spacecraft and it was delivered by Soyuz rockets. So all this took place at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, in, in the old Soviet Union. Um, so this was the first time that 
um, astronauts were delivered to the space station from the Cape in our own spacecraft for almost 10 years. It's also the first commercial astronaut delivery. This is not NASA doing this. This is NASA partnering with a private company called SpaceX. This is the capsule. So this is, you may remember the Apollo missions. He had the Apollo space capsule, but it was lifted by the Saturn V rocket. The Apollo part was just that tiny little nip on the top. This capsule here is the crew dragon riding on board the Falcon 9 rocket. They have a, it can send up to seven astronauts, I am told, or I should say I read. Um, but this time it only sent up two. This is the first, this was the test, in other words. They have a cargo dragon for supply flight, flights, and they have been supplying the space shuttle with cargo dragons on the Falcon 9 for a while. What's also interesting is this is the first partially reusable rocket, VTVL. I will talk about that. Vertical takeoff, vertical landing. This is an image of a test flight in, it's flight number 20 in 2015, where the uh, Falcon 9 rocket booster comes back down to Earth in powered flight. So VTVL, vertical takeoff, and then vertical landing, just like they used to do in the science fiction movies of 40 years ago. Now it's reality. Now this flight was the first partially reusable rocket with astronauts to reach LEO. LEO stands for Low Earth Orbit. Um, and it's, it's a lot of first. It's a great, it's a great achievement. And this is, I just want to talk a little bit about the Falcon 9. So here where I'm drawing it, this is the Crew Dragon right here. This is the first stage from here. It wasn't launched at an angle, okay? It's, it's on its way up to the tower. But this is the first stage all the way up to here. This is the, the fairing, and this is the second stage right here. Um, it's 280 feet tall, fueled by kerosene and liquid oxygen. That's what LOX stands for. And it has 1.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. That's very comparable to the Delta IV Heavy, as it's called, um, which can lift 2.1 million pounds. It's much smaller than the Saturn V, which could do three, or three times the Delta, four times the... Um, or maybe I should say five times what the Falcon 9 can do. But the Falcon 9 doesn't need to do that. It needs to get astronauts up. It's not sending anyone to the moon. Now, here's something I want to point out. 50,000 pounds to LEO, to low Earth orbit, is its capacity. That's when you use the full booster. But you saw here, if it's going to do a vertical takeoff, vertical landing, it's burning thrust here in order to keep from crashing. This is fuel that it's using on the way down that it can't use on the way up. So if you're gonna do a vertical takeoff, vertical land to recover it, you can only get 34,000 pounds up. So summary, nighttime for Jupiter and Saturn, morning for Var Mars and Venus, Mercury later on. Kepler's laws, number one, planets travel in ellipses, nearly circles, but what you really see is that the sun is off center. Two, planets move faster when they're closer to the sun and slower when they're further away. And three, distant planets take a defined longer period to orbit the sun and we can calculate what that is. I also wanna mention that planets have retrograde motion every year for the outer planets where they actually move backwards and do little loops. Um, homework, watch the moon move day by day. To see it one night and see it another, pay close attention to where it is, and you'll be able to see that the moon has moved. If you have a couple hours where you're going to be, you don't have to be out the whole time, but if you have a good shot at the sun or at the moon, go out, take a look at it. Look what stars are really nearby. Go inside, go back out, or maybe make a drawing. Make a drawing. Go back out a few hours later, and if your drawing is good enough, you will have seen the moon move just in a few hours. You can do that. View the summer triangle. Learn to recognize Cygnus the swan, that beautiful swan that flies completely inside the summer triangle of the three bright stars. Now you can do both of those all summer long. Watch Jupiter and Saturn dance late at night over the summer. This um, dancing back and forth as Jupiter catches up to Saturn will not happen again for another 20 years. 
So don't miss it. You got all the rest of the year to watch, but pay attention. You can watch Mars leaving behind. And again, another cool thing, see all five planets at once before dawn in late July. I don't know when that's going to happen again. I didn't look that up, but that's not common. And catch a meteor shower while you can. So final shot for questions. This was a little long, but I meant it to be long because again, I'm not going to be talking to you in July. So I had to get a lot of extra stuff in. Any final questions? Yeah, uh, we currently have one question. All right. That's where is SpaceX? Oh, that's a good question. Do you know the answer to that? Uh, no, not off the nope. top of my head. I know. Got me on, I was going pretty well there, but you got me on this one. I know SpaceX is a private company. I know it's run by Elon Musk. This is the same dude, by the way, who makes those cool electric cars. Um, the Teslas, there are a few in Midland. A friend of mine owns one. Um, so he's quite the technology entrepreneur. Um, I know one of his companies is in Salt Lake City. But I don't know. That's I think that's Tesla. I don't know if SpaceX is in Salt Lake or if it's some someplace else. I know that the Falcon 9 was launched from um, Cape Canaveral, from from Florida, where the Apollo missions were launched. Well, I do know that uh, I know somebody who did work there for a time, and they were in Reno, Nevada. So. Reno, Nevada. Okay, so that could be. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, a question: Slides. Where can we get them? Um, why don't you um, contact me at the email number that I have right there, and I will tell you where to get the slides. Because I don't, uh, I think they might just be, they might just be on Facebook, but I don't know about that. I really, I don't know. So we have a um, beautiful thing going here at Michigan State where we have lots of experts and lots of things. And so I have a very capable uh, colleague, uh, Melanie Kaufman, who handles the publicity and um, some very capable colleagues, uh, Nick Hinton, who I'm working with right now, and John Frashan, who handle some of the technical details. And um, one of them will know if and whether the slides are being posted. And if they are, I'll get that information to you. I'll, I'll answer you whether they are posted or not, just so you know. Uh, Melanie says she can post the slides to Facebook. Ah, so we just heard we can post the slides to Facebook. So apparently Melanie was listening. Oh, and while we are, while people are typing their questions, I have to show this off. This was a, in the COVID season, I'm going to get a little close to the camera. I don't know. I don't know if you can see this, but this is an astronomy mask. Nice star patterns on there. It was given to me by my mother and made for me by my mother-in-law and I wear it proudly. Oh, here's a question. All right. Does the sun turn? Does the sun turn is the question. Yes, it does. <clears throat> um, and since it's just a ball of gas and exploding um, plasma, how would we know? Well, we didn't know for most of history but uh, when Galileo turned his telescope to the sun, and do not ever point your telescope at the sun, Galileo used a projection system. Um, he discovered sunspots. And if you watch sunspots, you will observe that the sunspots slowly turn. They come in and out of you. And if they're big enough and they last long enough, they will go all the way around the sun. And that was an early indication that the sun not only turns, but that it's not solid. Because you, as you watch the sun turning, or rather, as you watch the sunspots move, you will observe that spots near the equator of the sun travel more significantly more quickly than spots near the poles. So that's how people not only learned that the sun turned, but they learned that it was not a solid body of any sort because it's moving in different speeds. Oh, and, and so the rotation period is like 25 to 30 days in that range, faster and faster near the equator. I think it's faster near the equator and slower near the poles. I hope I got that right, but I know it's different and it's about 25 days. 
Okay, and another question. When can you see Jupiter? You can see Jupiter starting at around, um, Jupiter rises, I'd say at around uh, 11 o'clock right now. It rises right about with the, um, it rises a little after sunset. But in order for it to be high enough in the sky, 11 or 12, you'd want to see it if you have a good Eastern view and it should be in the sky about an hour after sunset. Uh, you want to get a better view of it one or two in the morning because it'll be higher up and it'll be darker. But there's no other than the last little bit of Mercury that we're going to see for a while. There are no naked eye planets in the evening sky right now. They're all head, they're all in the morning except for Mercury and Mercury is headed there and in the month they're all going to be there and you want to get up in the morning. If you ever want to get up in the morning to look at planets, there'll be that three week time in July or if I can go back up to that. Well, I went way too far. There'll be that three week time in July where you might want to do that. Okay, and uh, we have uh, somebody responding. The SpaceX HQ and main assembly facility is in Hawthorne, California. Hawthorne, California. Which is in the oh. Los Angeles area. That's the, uh, the main assembly area. Yeah, and we do have another question. Uh, are the higher orbital speeds of inner planets due to the gravitational effects? Yes, that was one thing that I had in this talk and took out, and I think it's a shame to have to do that, but we have time restraints. One of the great triumphs of mathematics and physics is Isaac Newton, not just inventing the theory of gravity, but using his newly discovered, cal newly invented calculus, and his understanding of physics to prove that those three laws that I described, those Keplerian laws, are consequences of gravity. In other words, if gravity exists as Newton formulated it, then he can predict that relationship of high speed near for a planet near the sun and low speed further out. They can predict it will move a given planet will move faster when it's near the sun and slower as it gets further out from its orbit. All those things were shown by Newton to be consequences of his law of gravity. That's why he became so famous. That's one of the many reasons why he became so famous. And another cool thing about that, which may not have been obvious because I didn't mention it. Again, you only have so much time, but since we have a question on it, that inner that speed of the inner planets being faster and much slower when they're further out notice there was no mass in that equation it's the a year of a planet a year the the time it takes a planet to go around the sun once is a function of its distance the furthest distance it gets in its orbit it is not a function of time so if you took jupiter out of the solar system and put a tiny planet like mars in the same spot it would have the same speed as Jupiter. It's not a function of Jupiter's mass, it's only a function of its distance. And that is a really lucky thing because we didn't know the masses of any of the planets until probably your parents' lifetime. We didn't know them well, put it that way. So Kepler could never have discovered his laws if mass was part of the equation. So sometimes things work out. And we do have one more question. How far is Pluto to the sun? So um, I'll try to put it in scale. Um, the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun, on average, 92 to 94. That's a huge distance. Remember, it takes us many days to get to the moon, and the moon is a quarter of a million miles away. So the sun is, what is that, 400 times that far. Well, as far as that is, Pluto is about 3 billion miles away. Now, I can't say exactly how far it is because Pluto has a very elliptical orbit, more so than many of the other planets, and it's very tilted. So since Pluto has been discovered, it hasn't even gone around once yet. It's a 250-year thing. But um, when Pluto was discovered, it actually, it's so elliptical, it was actually closer to the sun than Neptune. Um, which is 
about 3 billion miles away. At its furthest, Pluto will be significantly further than 3 billion. You can look up the number. I don't know exactly how far it is. But uh, so given that, um, it is 30 times further from the sun than we are. Big numbers. Numbers are astronomical, you might say. So it looks like that's going to be about it for the night. I would say so. All right. So all of you, thank you very much for joining us. And we will let you know when the next, uh, next session is. And I hope to see you there. Thank you very much.